It's time now for News at 10. From ITN, News at 10 with Trevor MacDonald. The gold that broke the brave hearts of Scotland. Hoddle's hint on Michael Owen's role for England. MPs slam needless scare over vitamin B6. New look for classes in the education action zones. And Rusetsky limps home after his sad Wimbledon opener. Good evening. Scotland are out of the World Cup. In the disastrous 90 minutes sentence in St. Etienne tonight, they were beaten 3 0 by Morocco. And even if they had won, it wouldn't have saved them. Because at the same time, Norway were sensationally beating Brazil. It means that Scotland, who had Craig Burley sent off for a foul tonight, finish bottom of their group. Yet again, they'll be coming home early. The old dream of getting through to the second stage of the competition has eluded them once more. Our sports correspondent Graham Miller reports from France. Saint Etienne was transformed into little Scotland tonight as the Tartan army took over this town in the southeast of France. Full of colour and song, it was all good natured. This is what this festival of football is all about. And as the nation held its breath in anticipation back home, the sight of Rod Stewart in the crowd somehow settled the nerves. The players emerged knowing that even a win wouldn't guarantee their place in the next round and there was also the threat of a lottery draw if Scotland and Norway finished up on equal terms. Morocco had forecast beforehand they were going to play a long ball game. Scotland failed to listen. Saladin Bassier got on the end of it and that was that. For the third game running in France, Scotland gifted the opposition an early goal. But they've become used to battling back and were unlucky when Jackie McNamara might have won them a penalty. And Scotland created a series of chances to level the match. Gordon Dury had a go and so after a good build-up did Craig Burley but there was no first half equaliser. And before the break Scotland were indebted to Colin Hendry, a superb tackle from the skipper. The second half though began disastrously. Within 92 seconds of the restart Scotland were two down and it was almost a replay of the first goal. Had a chip Leighton and the oldest player in the World Cup could only help it in the goal. Craig Burley who dyed his hair blonde at the weekend was again the centre of attention. First a good shot but moments later a horrible tackle from behind on Bassir earned the Celtic man the inevitable red card from the referee. A disappointing end to what might have been a night of football history for Scotland was completed by Bassir when he tucked home number three for Morocco. Graham Miller, News at 10, France. So this is how Scotland's group looks tonight. In spite of their defeat, Brazil stayed top with six points. Norway's win gave them five points and in the end made Scotland's result irrelevant. Morocco, even though they won tonight, still came third with four points. And Scotland end their campaign at the bottom of Group A with a single point. Let's go now to our sports correspondent, Graham Miller in Paris. Graham, is it possible to put into words tonight the great, great disappointment in the Scottish camp? No, I don't think it is because Scotland are now on their way home tonight. Uh, as you may have seen, plenty of tears among the players, plenty of tears among the fans, both here in France and no doubt back in Scotland as well. They really felt, you know, at this their eighth attempt in a World Cup final, they would be able to progress into the second round for a very first time. But they were unfortunate, but not for the first time. In uh, the big game when it mattered, they simply couldn't score the goals when it mattered. Now, no disrespect here to uh, coach Craig Brown when he was appointed in 93. Nobody had really heard of him but he's made his name now but of course other great managers before him I'm thinking of Jock Steen in 82 and Alex Ferguson in 86 they've all, all tried and uh, failed with Scotland but now you know we must uh, add Morocco's name to that uh, list for Scotland of Iran Costa Rica and Estonia that list of national teams who Scotland really should have beaten to progress in major cup competitions and Graham we are yet to see the game yet it's coming up later on news at 10 but that sensational result by Norway against Brazil. What do you make of that? 
Well, that really was a surprise. Nobody expected that in a World Cup, although Norway did beat Brazil last year in, in a warm-up friendly competition. Brazil, of course, still everybody's favourites to win this World Cup, and they can lose at this stage and still go on to win it. But a marvellous win for Norway. Nobody expected them uh, to progress this far. But really tonight, we're thinking of Scotland. The tears are there, but they can go home with their heads held up high. Graham Miller, thank you very much. And as we said later in the programme, we'll have a report from Scotland and how the fans at home reacted to tonight's result. The England coach, Gen Hoddle, hinted today that Michael Owen could be on the field from the start for England's now crucial match against Colombia on Friday. According to an ITV poll today, it's what the fans want. The poll, conducted by Continental Research, suggests that the 18-year-old will be the choice of almost nine people out of every ten, 87%. 13% prefer Teddy Sheringham. There is also heavy support for David Beckham, another substitute last night. 78% prefer him to Darren Anderton. The England squad are now back at Le Boule in Brittany. Reporting from there, his ITN's Bill Neely. England's players watched Scotland tonight here in their hotel in Brittany, bruised after their defeat, but says Glenn Hoddle, full of confidence and self-belief. It was all smiles today. Goal scorer Michael Owen had good reason but even Glenn Hoddle was at it and he had no reason. The result against Romania, he said, was a disappointment. England had given away two goals. We gifted them two goals. We fell asleep. Uh, Schoolboy defensi defensive minds and um, at the end of the day, at this level, you're going to get punished. Michael Owen was already England's youngest goal scorer, now one of the youngest ever in the World Cup. The focus of attention and in today's poll, the people's choice to start the next game. Glenn Hoddle called him excellent and wonderful today and dropped a hint that he will start against Colombia. It's always, it was always my uh, intentions to nurse him into this World Cup. And the third game was always a, an opportunity for us. Colombia play a different style of football, uh, a little bit square. So that was always earmarked a little bit. Striker Alan Shearer today acknowledged the clamour for Owen to start. Well, I can, I can understand that because... Uh, He's been a threat whenever he's, he's played and he's, he's had a tremendous 12 month uh, behind him and he's scored goals uh, for his club and now he's, he's scoring goals uh, for his country. So the shadow over Sheringham grows. Neither Ince nor Southgate train today. Both are doubtful for Friday's showdown with Colombia. And a nail-biter it will be. A draw will give them the points to go through on goal difference. A win would give them so much more. Bill Neely, News at 10 with the England team. And another footnote to last night's match. Provisional figures show that last night's England game was watched on ITV by an average of 19.5 million people in their homes. The audience peaked at 21.5 million in the last quarter of an hour. The ITV poll suggested another 3.9 million watched in pubs or clubs. That would bring the total audience to over 25 million. Now the day's other news. An all-party committee of MPs today slammed the government attempt to restrict people to one small pill a day of vitamin B6. It's a popular stress buster. The MPs said the ban was based on scientifically unjustifiable evidence of a health risk and people should be allowed to decide for themselves whether to take B6 or not. Our political correspondent Lauren Taylor reports. Up to 3 million people, mainly women, take vitamin B6 pills every day in doses of up to 200 milligrams. The government had proposed to restrict the sale of pills, limiting the amount people can take to a daily dose of 10 milligrams. That was based on scientific evidence that high doses could cause nerve damage over a long period. But now the Select Committee on Agriculture has concluded that the science was flawed and people should be able to make up their own minds about whether to take it or not so long as they're given all the right information about potential health risks. In essence, what the Agriculture Committee has decided is that the government's proposals to introduce a, effectively a 10 milligram maximum daily dose of B6 are, are go too far, that the science doesn't justify that draconian uh, uh, restriction and that something uh, around 100 milligrams would be more appropriate. Government critics say that as with the ban on beef on the bone, the advice on vitamin B6 had been a case of ministerial nannies striking again. Campaigners who gathered large public support against the regulations argued that they would add cost and inconvenience for consumers. Tonight they welcomed the committee's recommendation that the government withdraw its proposal. The Ministry of Agriculture won't comment on the report until the consultation period on vitamin B6 ends later this week. But such a scathing report is likely to mean that the government will be more careful in future before it bans or limits any products. 
Lauren Taylor, News at 10 at the Ministry of Agriculture. Police confirmed tonight that a body recovered from a river in Cheshire today was that of Claire Hart, the 13-year-old who went missing last Thursday. Claire, from the village of Eton near Congleton, was last seen in a field she regularly walked through on her way to school. ITN's Tim Rogers reports. After all the searching, this is where Claire Hart's body was found, trapped by strong currents in the River Dane. Incredibly, in the same location where police divers were filmed two days ago searching underwater, apparently passing it by inches. 13-year-old Claire had been missing since last Thursday morning. She disappeared while walking to school and was last seen alive talking to a man at this point just 300 yards from her destination. Tonight, a police spokeswoman confirmed that Claire's body had been identified by her family. Her mother, father and sister are obviously very, very distraught. Both parents have the very difficult task of identifying Claire. The news has shocked the village of Eton, where local people had been fearing the worst. I mean, the kid we used to see every day and talk to every day, she went past, you know, and all of a sudden she isn't there anymore. Yesterday, 19-year-old Craig Smith appeared before magistrates in Macclesfield charged with Claire's abduction. He was remanded in custody until Thursday. During the last few days, there seemed to be a growing inevitability that Claire Hart would not be found alive. Tonight, that sad prediction has come true and a community is in mourning. Tim Rogers, News at 10, Congleton in Cheshire. We have more top stories to come on News at 10 tonight, including the plans to bring in big businesses to help run schools. Drama in court today as Brijo's stepfather gives his evidence. Battling injury, Rosetsky's struggle to stay on at Wimbledon. And don't come home too soon, a sad, nail-biting evening north of the border. Do you know the first meal I ever cooked for Jerry? Prawn cocktail to start, black forest gatto to finish, and a very juicy steak. Well, I thought I'd try and rekindle the flames. He does love a decent steak. Your local Summerfield has great prices on a superb choice of fresh meat, and butchers in store who make it all easy by preparing it just the way you like. Mom, I can't sleep. Oh, yes you can, sweetheart. Mitsubishi Galant displays some surprisingly human characteristics. Its passive rear-wheel steering acts instinctively to keep a firm grip on the road, whilst its climate control system stabilizes the temperature to within a fraction of a degree. And the revolutionary automatic gearbox actually learns your individual driving style and adapts to the road conditions. The new Mitsubishi Galant, reinventing the wheel. Everyone knows the old rules of photography. Oh, that's right, film for direct sunlight. But Kodak Gold Ultra breaks them all. Oh, using the same film in here. Why not? Kodak Gold Ultra performs brilliantly in almost all conditions. And now, zip cha cha. And that shot will never come out. Of course it will. Even action shots. Just remember, if this film isn't in your camera, imagine the pictures you'd miss. Kodak Gold Ultra. Film for all conditions. Now, Cellnet introduces First for Firms. It's the same great savings idea for business mobile phones as BT's friends and family is for homes. Your firm chooses 10 numbers. We give you free extra discounts on every call you make to them. If you join Cellnet's three new firsts, we could cut your firm's peak calling price from 24p to 16.3p per minute. That's a price cut of up to 32%. Call us. We have a lot to talk about. If you're traveling from central London, here, and you want to go to Brussels, here, then I am wondering why so many of you choose to go by here. Maybe this is the famous British sense of humor. Visit Brussels for only £79 return. Hi, it's me, the Hurrens Bee. Don't forget, Hurrens Garden Centers help make your garden buzz. Once again, a better burger, better get to Burger Star. Tuck into a tasty mega star or chicken BLT. For the best burger yet, better get to Burger Star. 
right now at your local Summerfield, top side of beef is half price. With an offer that good, why wait until Sunday? Welcome back. The first 25 of the proposed education action zones in England were named today. The government's promoting them as test beds for the school system of the next century. The key difference is that business will be involved in running the schools in the designated zones. Business will also put money into them. Our education correspondent Helen Wright reports. For pupils at this London Comprehensive, being in an education action zone will mean a longer school day, a curriculum tailored to their needs, and all will be expected to become computer literate, a skill which could ease the move from classroom to work. A manager from Shell International is already working with the school's head. Business will pump a quarter of a million pounds a year into the zone, and both sides say they have something to gain from the venture. We have a vested interest in having good pupils coming out and coming into, into business for employment. So it's a two-way process. I don't like to talk about children as being a product, but they expect at the end to achieve whatever they need to go on the next stage. They're only stay at the 60 at the moment, and they have to have what's necessary. With business, again, they have to achieve. The education zones are designed to raise classroom standards by using business expertise. The first 12 start up across England in September, from Newcastle in the north to Croydon in the south. A further 13 zones will be up and running by January next year. Schools in the zones will get both government funding and extra money from business. They'll also be able to adapt the national curriculum, and improving literacy and numeracy will be a priority. The schools will also employ high-flying teachers known as super teachers to raise standards, and some plan to experiment with new teaching methods, like in Grimsby, where they'll put lessons on local TV, and in Somerset, where pupils will take laptop computers home to do their homework. The Education Secretary believes the zones mark a revolution in English schooling. If we can use our imagination, the commitment of our teachers, and we can link up with the best that exists in business, we can really raise the standard of education for our children in a way that's not been possible for decades. But teachers' unions fear that while the children David Blunkett met today will enjoy the benefits of the action zones, pupils in schools bordering them will not, further dividing the haves from the have-nots. Helen Wright, News at 10. The Prime Minister's Chief Press Secretary, Alistair Campbell, robustly defended his role to a committee of MPs today. Mr Campbell, who's been accused of abusing public office, denied any wrongdoing. He said he'd never described Chancellor Gordon Brown as psychologically flawed or given briefings against other cabinet ministers. But he agreed that the problem of leaking and trailing policy announcements was getting worse. Sean Jenkins, the deputy headmaster charged with the murder of his foster daughter, Billy Jo Jenkins, spent his second day at the witness box at Lewis Crown Court today. He said Billy Jo had been in a happy, carefree mood on the day she was killed. He said he had no theory about how she was killed. Our South of England correspondent Adrian Britton reports. Leading the prosecution, Mr Camden Pratt, whose cross-examination of Sean Jenkins was watched today in a packed courtroom with people standing in the public gallery. He suggested that Jenkins believed a prowler had murdered Billy Joe. The former deputy headmaster said he didn't know how she'd been killed, that he didn't have a theory. I am not a detective, he said. He added that his 13-year-old foster daughter had been in a jubilant and happy mood as she painted the patio doors of the family home where she was bludgeoned to death. The court heard she'd climbed on her foster father's shoulders as he was crouched down teaching her to paint. Mr Camden Pratt asked, was this behaviour common when you were alone together? Jenkins replied, it was more common when we were all together. Mr Camden Pratt, do you think she was trying to tease or flirt with you? She was not, said Jenkins, not at all. Jenkins said he couldn't remember how he had got paint on the fleece jacket he was wearing on the day of the murder. Mr Pratt said, may I suggest you got paint on your cuff when you attacked her? Jenkins said emphatically, and you would be wrong. Sean Jenkins, who is pleading not guilty to murder, will face further cross-examination tomorrow after the court was adjourned early today when a juror fell ill. Adrian Britton, News at 10 at Lewis Crown Court. 
Rain stopped play at Wimbledon today, allowing only 11 of the 64 matches scheduled to be completed. All eyes were on the British number one, Greg Rosetsky, who appeared on court one despite his recent ankle injury. He faced the little-known Australian Mark Draper, and when Rain halted play for the day, Rosetsky was struggling to stay in the match. Our sports reporter, Peter Staunton, was there. Greg Rosetsky limped onto number one court. The crowd and girlfriend Lucy already desperately worried whether his suspect ankle could last a full match. Opponent Mark Draper was thankfully way down the world rankings. In the first set, Rosetsky bravely struggled to stay in contention. And remarkably won it 6-4, despite being almost marooned on the baseline. After that, it went quickly downhill, Rosetsky finding any swift movement impossible. It was at times embarrassing to watch. He tried to lift a subdued crowd, but double faults littered his normally devastating service game. One final ace left it finely balanced, one set all. When the rain came to give Rosetsky a much needed overnight rest. Within minutes, he was leaving the courts, heading for more intensive treatment and putting a brave face on things. I'm feeling all right. We'll see how it goes tomorrow. How are you? Are you nervous about tomorrow? Well, we'll see. Tomorrow's another day. But it may well be his last. The defending women's champion, Martina Hingis, dodged the showers and the court covers to beat off a brave but forlorn challenge from the American Lisa Raymond in just two sets. Tomorrow, Greg Rosetsky continues what looks like a hopeless fight against injury, and Tim Henman reappears on centre court. By the end of the day, though, he could well be the only one left flying the British flag. Peter Staunton, News at 10, Wimbledon. Back now to the World Cup, and as well as Scotland's agony, it's been a day of drama in other decisive games in the competition today. Confirmation there now of the other game in Scotland's Group A, Norway snatching that dramatic win over Brazil. In Group B, Italy beat Austria to qualify for the second round, while a draw was enough for Chile to scrape through to the knockout stages. ITN's Will Warden has this report. Whatever was about to happen in St Etienne between Scotland and Morocco, Norway knew victory over holders Brazil was essential. And in a scrappy first half, Brazil hardly looked the world champions they are. Roberto Carlos's free kick the only threat. At the break, Norway looked the better team, but couldn't find an opening. Into the second half, and Brazil seemed to have sealed Norway's fate with a goal out of nothing. The header from Bebeto. But incredibly, Norway equalised with just seven minutes to go. Tor Andre Flo, the scorer. And then the decision that will be debated for days to come. Roberto Carlos, a judge to have committed a foul in his own penalty area. Rekdal was left with the responsibility. He scored, and Norway had pulled off the greatest of escapes. Earlier in Paris, Italy had qualified as the winners of Group B. Thanks to Christian Vieri's second half header against Austria, his fourth goal in the competition. A late tap in from substitute Roberto Baggio put the result beyond doubt before Austria managed a consolation goal in injury time. Italy will play Norway in the second round. In Nantes, Cameroon had to beat Chile to stand any chance of qualifying, but Chile appeared to have booked their place in round two, thanks to Jose Sierra's perfectly executed free kick. Only for Patrick and Bomber to equalise in the second half. Cameroon could have won it deep in injury time, but the header drifted wide, and the Africans were out. Chile's reward, a date with Brazil in the last 16. Will Walden, News at 10. So, those results mean that Group B finished like this. Italy finished top with seven points. Chile qualified as second place team by virtue of three drawn games. They now play the champions Brazil in the second round. And now a World Cup minute. Tonight it's on Colombia, the South American side that England meet in their deciding match on Friday. In the last World Cup, Colombia went out in the first round and one of their players paid for it with his life, as Dennis Tui reports. Colombia are probably the least predictable team in world football. Goalkeeper Rene Higuita's mistake cost them dear in the 1990 finals. But in 1994, an own goal by defender Andres Escobar had more serious consequences, costing Colombia a place in round two and Escobar his life. He was murdered by a fan on his return home. Colombia have qualified for four World Cup finals in 1962, 1990 and 1994 and the current tournament but they've yet to get past the first round. Recent form, though, puts them 10th in FIFA's world rankings, six places below England. 
They are, however, an ageing side. Carlos Valderrama, their best player, and the man who masterminded yesterday's win over Tunisia, is 36. Internal wrangling led the former Newcastle star, Faustino Aspria, to quit last week. And coach Gomez says he'll go after the tournament. But it's that South American passion and flair which could be so dangerous for England. The main headlines again, an all-party committee of MPs has fiercely criticised a government attempt to restrict the use of vitamin B6. The report said the ban was based on unjustifiable evidence. And police have confirmed that a body recovered from a river in Cheshire today was that of the missing schoolgirl, Claire Hart. But tonight's news is dominated by the World Cup and tonight's sad exit for the Scotland team. A short time ago, their coach Craig Brown gave his reaction. Very disappointed, particularly for the wonderful supporters that have come here. And I'm sure a lot of people back home will be as disappointed as we are. I'm afraid you can't give goals away that we, we did at this level and hope to survive. And we conceded two terribly bad goals, uh, one uh, in the first half and one at the start of the second half. Thereafter, it was an uphill climb, and when you're used to ten men, we fought bravely, but we weren't good enough at that stage. And I'm afraid uh, the result, certainly I think, flattered Morocco, but we were the losing side, and I think Morocco deserved to win. And on that brave and wretched night for Scottish football, we end the programme tonight in Scotland. Harry Smith reports from Glasgow on how the Scots fans took the news of their World Cup failure. As the final whistle drew near, they put their hands together and willed their team to greater things. But rescue never came. Another would-be Scottish sporting triumph ending in the familiar taste of defeat. The evening had kicked off with such high hopes as fans all over Scotland packed into pubs showing the match on television. Some, like so many glasses of beer, overflowing at the brim. And it wasn't just the pubs which were full. At this church hall in Glasgow, young children and their parents packed in to watch the match in a family atmosphere. Others, though, had business to finish before joining the estimated two and a half million Scots who tuned into the game. Those who couldn't watch stayed close to their car radios. There was no shortage of taxis for hire, but with streets nearly deserted, there were few customers. Throughout the land, the opening goal was greeted with disbelief. This is a half-time score so reminiscent of Scottish performances in the past, but nobody here is ready to give up yet. Scottish fans have been down this road many times before. In what is now a well-practiced routine, they celebrated an effort which for a short time had given them a vision of how things could have been. Harry Smith, News at 10, Glasgow. And that's News at 10 tonight. We're back tomorrow. From all of us here at ITN, good night. Hello, good evening. Well, as we approach the end of June, I'm afraid there's no sign of summer taking hold, not just yet. An unsettled day, the reason why low pressure in charge with our weather, pushing these fronts across the country. And looking ahead to the weekend, we see no respite at all, still low pressure in charge, and a tangle of fronts there wrapped around the low, basically translating into yet another unsettled weather scene. So tonight, we have rain pushing into western fringes, into much of Scotland, the west of England and west Wales, becoming breezy for a while too, down in the southwest, drier out to the east, and temperatures quite mild into double figures. We go into tomorrow morning, and for the southeastern corner there, dry, fairly bright start. A lot of cloud lurking around elsewhere, with rain as well, but some brightness, some glimmers of sunshine over Northern Ireland. Then during the course of the day, that rain tends to fade away, progressing eastwards. At the same time, we have a couple of showers developing, cropping up there during the afternoon in Northern Ireland. With our temperatures better than today's, a high of 24 in the southeast, 75 in Fahrenheit 